but I realized after some time and really kind of making it through those hard times of like, you know what? No, this is something that I love because I, I did think about maybe I should change careers, you know, all of my evaluations and note taking and really taking that time to understand more about me. I knew that I wanted to be in this industry. I can't walk away. Welcome to the Game of Her Own podcast, a podcast about women who work in sports. I'm your host, Jahan Blake. After 15 years of working for three major league teams, including the Boston Red Sox, Los Angeles Dodgers, and the Chicago Cubs, I discovered the one thing I loved the most was helping women in sports shatter glass ceilings and take their seat at the table. I loved it so much that I made a business out of it. I have the honor of coaching high-performing women in the sports and entertainment industry and supporting them as they go after exactly what they want in their career. So if you are feeling tired of waiting on the sidelines, done being overlooked for promotions, and you're ready to pull ahead of the pack and take your career to the next level, girl, I'm here for it. I also created the Game of Her Own podcast to support you as well. We are here to share the stories of incredible women who work in sports and entertainment. These leaders and trailblazers will inspire you with their success and the lessons they've learned along the way to the top. Ladies, there is nothing like women empowering women. I am so honored you're here. I met our next guest when I hosted a Cocktails and Conversation for Women in Sports. She had this great energy about her, like total boss. And she didn't have to say much for you to get that feeling from her. So I was not surprised when I learned about her impressive experience in the sports industry. I'm talking Miami Dolphins, Sacramento Kings, 49ers, Cowboys, the Olympics. In her most recent experience, Cicely Nash is the senior events producer for Sportico. Cicely, who I had the honor of supporting in the 2021 Be Seen and Heard group coaching program, talks to us about some great topics that you 100% can relate to and learn from Cicely's approach. She talks about how she learned to use her voice when she was working for the Dolphins. She is vulnerable and says why she was surprised when she got the job with the Dallas Cowboys. She talks about what motivated her to move from organization to organization. She talks about how to deal with a toxic work environment. She also talks about how to hold your managers accountable. I loved every minute of my conversation with Cicely, and I know you will too. All right, Game of Her Own listeners, let's do this. Cicely, welcome to the Game of Her Own podcast. I am so excited to have you on. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here as well. Well, before we dive in, because you have some incredible, incredible experience, uh, and I know everyone's going to want to hear about it and hear about your journey, but take us back in time and tell us when you first fell in love with sports. You know, I don't remember a time when I wasn't in love with sports. I always get the comment of like, you were born with a football in your hand just because how heavily involved uh, my family, I grew up, all, a lot of my fun and great memories come from sporting events and sporting activities. And so it was really at a young age, I was, I was always active, participated in sports. I had two brothers that were professional athletes. Uh, my uncle was also a professional athlete. And so just being around a family that Everything that we did, it was going to practice here, going to practice there. Some of my greatest memories for sure. So yeah, I, I would say I fell in love with really probably the day I was born is when I fell in love with <laughs> yeah. That's what I was going to say. I was like, it sounds like you just kind of, you know, arrived on this earth and we're ready, ready to go. Now did you say yeah. your uncle was a professional athlete? Yes, yes. My, oh, my, I didn't know that. Uncle Walter Wesley in the NBA through, through my aunt. But uh, yeah, he played in the NBA for many years. Uh, but really, was my, my father was, was heavily involved in sports. He was, uh, was an athlete. And so it really kind of started there as, you know, I'm a baby of, of five. And so, uh, you know, my brothers were, were athletes. So we that's kind of like, you know, you go to school, do your homework, but there needs to be some kind of extra particular a- activities that you need to participate in, especially yep. with, from Oklahoma. So football was big, basketball. And so, yeah, I I participate in a lot of different sports for sure. What was your sport of choice? Um, You know, it was different at different ages. Like I really loved basketball when I was a little younger. Then I kind of fell in love in track and field. And then I I loved soccer for a little bit. I played a little intramural soccer. I was not good at all, but I enjoyed doing that kind of stuff. Uh, And then eventually in college, I kind of just played sports for fun, stay active. 
stay in shape. But yeah, there was always, I would try to stay as active as possible growing up. You know, what's funny is, so you said you weren't good at soccer and you ran track. I ran track and I was not good at track. And it was (laughs) so anxiety producing. Yes. I like couldn't handle it. Like I loved soccer because like I was nervous, but it was a team sport. So as soon as you started playing, like I forgot, but for track, I could remember still running in the anxiety. I was just like, can people see this anxiety coming out of my body? Like, did you get anxious? I think the, the, the competition of it all. And I think that's probably, you know, me being competitive in my family and and where (laughs) the heart and desire of being competitive is probably the adrenaline is what I really love. Like that nervous tick. Mm -hmm. That adrenaline rush when you're getting ready to step out on the court or getting ready to kind of set in the blocks. Uh, it, it's what I love the most. And yeah, it definitely kept me interested for sure. And then I also love dance. So I, I did um, ballet and tap and jazz and all that good stuff too. So I definitely tried to stay active and I uh, was a very creative child for sure. You were crazy active. Like, I mean, all the things. And now you're what, a marathon runner? Do I have that right? Yeah, well, I, I'm definitely not an elite runner for sure, but yeah, it is. I, uh, I'm so blessed to love what I do for work, but I, I found a really awesome hobby of like traveling and staying active and running. And so I, I got the itch when I ran my first marathon, fell in love, and then realized also my love of like solo travel and international travel. And so been on a goal and a journey to run a marathon in each continent. And that's just kind of been my hobby for the past several years. Wow. All right. Well, tell us, all right, when did you make that transition? Because your whole career has really been in sports. So when did you know you wanted to work in sports? Um, you know, I, I would probably say in, in college at the University of Kansas, Rock Chalk. Uh, I would <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, my background was pre-med, so I did have uh, the, an idea and, and really a journey that I wanted to go to med school and be an orthopedic surgeon. And so got my biochemistry degree at the University of Kansas. And so, you know, really wanted to take that path of applying to grad school and doing all of that. And I think when I went on my site visit at KU Med, um, I did a whole walkthrough. And so the, the very last end of the, the site visit and the tour, they kind of like give you a little photo that's like all the costs and finances that's going to take to attend school and residency and all that. And it was like, uh, what? Like it was going to be obviously a two, $300,000 financial commitment. And I really had to figure out, is this something you really wanted to do? And so I really kind of took a pause before, like I took my MCATs, I did all of that. But before really realizing this is something I wanted to do, I went into the work field a little bit and I worked as I'm an analyst for a pharmaceutical company. Uh, and, and I would say definitely at that moment and being at that in the workforce, working at a pharmaceutical company, working with FDA, I realized that, you know, there's something more that I love. And I was always involved in, in watching sports and in the business aspect. Um, at that time, I did have a brother that was a professional athlete and, and friends. I began having friends and other family members as professional athletes that I just kind of would go and see and attend games and just be a part of that environment. And I realized, you know what, I think my passion is, is really an in industry. It's so funny that because I always wanted to run away from the sports business because, you know, my whole family and I was surrounded all the time of being an athlete. And then you know, even growing up, high school, I spent a lot of my weekends going to my brother's football games and, and traveling and going to the University of Tennessee one weekend and going to the University of Wyoming the next. And so, you know, there was always, you know, again, having those wonderful family memories. And so I think taking that medical route was something that I really wanted to try on my own and kind of be different in my family. But I think I realized sports was always the number one passion of mine and something that I truly loved. And so my aha moment, I realized, you know what, I think I want to I want to learn more about the, the business aspect, the business side of sports. I've always been a fan, family member, attended, but there, there's a whole piece, you know, there's a whole business behind these athletes. And so that's what's really participated in, in me wanting to go and get my master's degree in sports administration. And from there, that's where my career started. I mean, that's crazy that you, to think that you wanted to run away from it. Yeah. You were like, no, 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 I'm not. I'm not doing that. Like, yeah. at all. But it was a sign, like just from knowing you, right, and and working with you, like you are happy in sports. Like there's no sense of regret that I feel from you. 
so many memories, even today, like this past weekend, like watching the ball card Saturday and Sunday, just the joy of me, like watching the games. And I have that for really all sport events and I'll watch, I can watch sports all day long. But I think that, you know, I always have those wonderful, happy memories um, that is surrounded around a sporting event, that team environment, feeling a part of, you know, that team and rooting the on, rooting on the underdog. Yeah, I realized, I think if it wasn't for me kind of taking that different avenue earlier in my career to understand, to get to my true passion, uh, you know, I, I'm happy every day and I'm, and I'm so grateful and, and thankful that like I, I could do this every single day. I can work in sports uh, forever. That's great. Tell everybody what you do now and who you do it for. Yeah, so I am the senior events producer at Sportico. Uh, Sportico is a sports media company. And so I am producing events. It actually opened up during the pandemic in 2020. And so I, I'm here to kind of help and facilitate different um, events that we're having and hopefully in person here in 2022. Wow. So you're in a startup. Yeah, it's a, it is. It's definitely a, a startup for sure. We are under the Penske uh, Media conglomerate. That's the corporation. So we do have that that support and under Penske Media is companies like Billboard, Rolling Stones, Hollywood mm-hmm. Reporters. So a lot of those media companies are within PMC. Uh, and so we are kind of the sports division of PMC. And it's been great. It's been a little scary, but but great to be a part of a really small team, but really to have the flexibility of being to be creative. I think I, I'm so used to working in a box. And because of my, you know, 13 plus years of working at a venue, doing particular events, I'm so used to like, you know, having that foundation, having that standard, but with here at Sportico, having the ability to be creative and really it's about getting the right people in the room. You know, we, we are curating these wonderful events and, and making sure we make an impact in, in the sports business. You have incredible experience. I'm looking at it all here. Dolphins. You were at Legends Hospitality, where the Cowboys are, their um, their whole department or their whole business that they have. You were with the Sacramento Kings. You were with NBC Sports. Like, yes. you have some incredible experience. Talk about bouncing around. Not Bouncing around is not the right way to say it because I'm so tired of people like saying, oh, you know, it's not younger people. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm definitely going to, I'm definitely going to qualify this. It's not younger people. It's an older generation was like, oh, well, she bounced around a lot or he bounced around a lot. So <laughs> like, you know, my clients come to me, I have a hole in my, you know, in my, um, in my resume, or I've been at this job for a year. I'm not happy, but I don't want to leave because it looks bad. I'm like, to who? Like, <laughs> to who? Like, get out. Like, there's no need to say. Anyway, I digress. So you have all this experience. You've gone from different organizations. Talk about what that was like and what your thought process was to want to, you know, move around. For me, I really strive on learning. I think that's what really motivates me is learning something new every day. And I, I think the opportunity of, of one, being able to nurture my career. And, and so I, I make sure that I advocate and tell a lot of people that I mentor is, are you sure you want to leave this position? Why are you leaving? What is the goal? What is the purpose, right? We all have a purpose for wherever we're at in our position and with our team. And so I always ask myself those kind of questions and to make sure that is the reason that I'm leaving is because, oh, I I just feel like that I need to leave. And I, you know, it's time for me to go somewhere else. For me, it was very strategic and it was really important for me that I nurtured my career. I understood what my job responsibilities were first off. And, you know, I think from there being able to excel at that. But I've also always a person that was very proactive and made sure that I did things outside of my job responsibilities, meaning if I could shadow other departments, learn as much as possible. Um, not only in my role, but also be a part of my team. And and I was trained to not just focus on solely on my events, but, you know, my colleagues, anything that I was really interested in, whether it was a stadium buyout, we had stadium buyouts at AT AT&T Stadium. And I didn't have that experience yet, but I really wanted to know what that is like. And so I I reached out to my colleagues or I would follow them, shadow them, or just assist them on the operations of running a full stadium buyout event. And so those type of things are really important for me to make sure that I'm learning the ins and outs um, of the special events business, of production, of the venue that I'm at. 
And then it was really all about having that career mindset and development mindset that, you know, am I taking the next role to help me develop my skill set and, and put me into a role of leadership? Uh, and that took me a while to understand. Initially in my career, I was very shy. Surprisingly, people don't <laughs> believe me, but you know, I was really shy when I first started off at, at the Miami Dolphins. I think that I didn't take a lot of things seriously. I think also I was really kind of scared to speak up, to have a voice. And so a lot of it, I kind of just stayed back, was really quiet, just kind of watched what people did, didn't really want to ask questions. And then I think, you know, as I became more confident just in my abilities and being able to experience different things, I realized that like, you know, my voice is important. A lot of times I'm in rooms of full men and because I started in operations, stadium operations, football operations, there's not too many people that look like me. And so I realized that I had some, some value to add. And so I think when I started to feel comfortable in asking questions, I definitely got some great feedback and I realized, oh, okay, maybe this question I am having is not so stupid. I, I can't ask a question and they just say, oh yeah, you know, that's a really good thought or no, we can't do this because of this. So yeah, I think that was always my plan of, of making sure that I nurtured my career. I understood where I wanted to go. And then it was just a really great opportunity to continue to de develop my career. And, and I've been lucky throughout the different organizations I've worked for. It, it hasn't really been by applying for applying online. It, it's really has been through at someone that knew me, someone that has seen my work, someone who has recommended me. Um, and so I've been blessed and lucky to, to have those different opportunities just through that. Through that. So I understood that my, my reputation was really important because I started to get these roles and these opportunities from somebody hearing about me or a connection to another person or someone, you know, an executive coming to my event and realizing how amazing it was and would I be interested in moving. I feel like I have all these follow-up questions. So let's go back to something really resonated with me. And I wonder um, if it resonates with the audience too, like your background, your upbringing, like you're the youngest of all your siblings, right? Like you're the baby of the family. Yeah. It sounds like you were very active and, but you were also shy, but you still got, you got your job at the dolphins, but you were kind of quiet and didn't use your voice. And that reminds me a lot of me when I started with the Red Sox, like I got the job and then I got there and I was like, Oh, like, okay. Like what? Like, you know, I wasn't, I was hesitant to like use my voice and speak up. And I didn't think I had enough experience to do so at that level. I mean, it was part-time and that's not the case, but I guess my question to you is what do you think that is? <laughs> like, where, where do you think that came from? And I only say it because I asked you that question. Cause I'm like, I wonder if we can help other people too, who are in that same, that same boat. Like, where do you think that comes from? Like that all of a sudden getting into an organization and then just being like, Oh, I don't want to speak up. I think with growth and just uh, me getting older and feeling more comfortable in my skin, I'll definitely say younger, earlier in my career, I wasn't as comfortable in who I was. And so that's not understanding and realizing that that betrayed in my work. And so that caused me to be a lot more timid um, to not ask as many questions. I think too, I, I, I joked a lot. I was funny. I wanted to be like the funny person, you know, not take things seriously. And I'll never forget this. There, there was a moment um, at the time, director of youth programs at the Dolphins, Twan Russell, he kind of pulled me to the side and he said, you know, he said, man, you have a great attitude, but, but you know, you're always joking with everyone. How is anyone supposed to take you seriously about things if you're always you know, joking and not really taking meetings seriously or, or you're, you're laughing all the time. And I was like, huh, you know what? That's, I never really thought about that. People saw me as maybe the timid person, the jokester, but they never really saw me seriously as someone who could really add value to a conversation, add value to a particular event. And, you know, I don't think he realized how much that really kind of clicked in my head of like, okay, let me try to figure out, because that's not what I want people to think. Like, I want people to have a wonderful experience with me, enjoy interacting and, and talking to me, and let's have a great time. But I also want people to treat me as a professional. Uh, and, but, and I would say it was probably, too, a little bit of adolescence, because I was so used to kind of hiding back in the background, being the baby of five, there, there's a large gap between me and my siblings. And so I was always kind of able to kind of have that role uh, and, and maybe that played a little bit of part of you know, how I was feeling when I when I first started initially in my career. 
But I realized as I got older and, and got more knowledge that, you know, I do have value to add to the organization. And I, I didn't need the, the attaboys at, at the organization. I knew what I was doing was right. I knew how the team president, the guests, how they felt wonderful when they left my events. And I knew that that was that was important. So it sounds like to me, like when you first started at the Dolphins, you were like the joking and the sarcasm was probably like your defense mechanism, right? Yeah. Like, but you like to build relationships, but you weren't like at that point confident enough to build them by showing your value. So yeah. you yeah. showed your sense of humor and like your funny side. Yeah. And that sure. was your way of building relationship. What great advice you received. Yeah. Yeah. It was amazing too. And, and I think too, just naturally, I always in, in general have connected really well with men. I think, you know, being surrounded around men, a lot of my friends are men. Um, I think that interaction um, allowed a lot of my male mentors come to me and kind of have that straight talk with me, but also helped me professionally and how I can grow kind of in this male dominated industry for sure. And how to make sure, you know, someone wants to take me seriously. And uh, yeah, I think that I could attribute a lot of that to the different male figures that I've had throughout my career. I, I love that advice that you received. And then I love that you received it well. You did not take it personal or maybe you did take it personal, but what you received it with love, which it was probably intended, right? You yes. Know, to help you grow. Maybe love's too strong a word, but you get what I'm saying. That's fantastic. So then you started using your voice and you were ready to go and you were on fire or did you like swing back and forth? I know when I would like, I know I think I still do it to this day. Like I have confidence, confidence, confidence. And then like, uh, I swing back to like how I used to be. And like my inner mean girl starts talking to me and then I, I, I get back out of it. Like, were you on fire after that advice that you received or did you go back and forth? Oh yeah, I definitely went back and forth. I was probably just a little bitty like baby spark with smoke for a very <laughs> long time. <laughs> I would definitely not, you know, I would probably say I wasn't on fire until later on in my career. So probably when I was at at t Stadium with the Dallas Cowboys, um, first I, I was so in awe that I even got the job. I don't know. I think at that moment I felt like I actually got this job. Do I deserve being here? Like this is the pinnacle of like being a part of Met, uh, America's team, working for Legends, like having this wonderful opportunity to be here these awesome marquee events that's about to come up. You know, when I first got it, I'll never forget this when at the time, my director, Monique Boyd, who's a very close friend of mine now, when she called me and told me I got the job, I was just like, wait, what? I got this job? (laughs) (laughs) Are you sure? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Because like, this is something I prayed for and this was like so amazing. But Yeah, she saw something in me. You know, I may have not came from a standard catering background that maybe she was used to with with the other applicants, but she saw something in me that she really wanted to give me this wonderful opportunity. And and I think being there, really my confidence just boosted even more because I felt like being there, like I deserve to be here. Like I'm pumping out all these different events. I'm executing a lot of events within, you know, multiple events in days and weeks and still able to keep up. And and that's when I really realized like, okay, I I belong in this space. I'm doing a really great job. Um, You know, I had a lot of encouragement and mentorship by Monique. I was kind of like her right hand and she was really able to encourage and put a lot of pressure on me and a lot of stress, but it really was for the best for sure. And and a lot of things that she taught me, um, I've been able to, to this day, still execute and still keep those things in mind for sure. So it sounds like it's like your confidence was a combination of you believing in yourself, but also really working for somebody like a really good leader, a really good manager who believed in you. And it sounds like if I heard you correctly, also pushed you like she, she held the bar high. For sure. She definitely did. She uh, allowed me to really kind of just throw me in the deep end and maybe put her hand out there to help me. But I, I think for me, that also helped me even more to be confident to you know ask questions and to make sure that I have all the details. You know, I, I'll definitely say before I got to that stadium in Dallas, uh, that was about seven or eight years that I was in events and, and special events. And I thought I knew everything for sure. <laughs> and No, when I got to her, just the attention to detail that's so required. And when you're with that organization, you have to give 150% every day. I mean, it starts from the top with Mr. Jones, and that is taught 
from from the bottom throughout the family. You know, when you're working with legends, the legends way that that's when they say that that's truly what they mean. And so I really realized that I had to kind of step up to that opportunity and to really put my best foot forward. And as I was able to see a lot of different successes, being able to execute a lot of these different things, I realized that I have to believe in myself and be confident for sure. I love that. And I love that example. And hopefully everyone's takeaway is like your leaders, your managers, it really starts, like you said, it starts at the top. So it's so crazy. You may not work with Mr. Jones, but you know, like his attitude, his philosophies are reflected in his leadership team and his manager. And it comes all the way down to all of us. And so it's so important to make sure you choose your managers and your leaders really well. And if you don't like where you are, it's okay to leave (laughs) because it has to do with your development and how your career is going to go. Yeah. And definitely for me too, I think for me is where I really got that passion and and even more of wanting to step into a leadership role, you know, I realized that that is a, a strong skill of mine. And so that helped me kind of, you know, making sure that even the, the next decisions that I would make within my career would put me at a leadership role for sure. And, and being a part of that organization definitely helped me see and, and understand that. Game of Her Own listeners, have you heard the news? The doors to the Be Seen and Heard at Work group coaching experience are open. I'm talking about the program that will help you take the next level in your career. This means doors are open. You can save your seat before we run out of space. And if you are wondering if this program is the right fit for you, where you are in your career right now, I will keep it super simple for you. It is. Oh, I'm kidding. I don't know that yet. But let me tell you what my clients have told me. My clients have joined the program because at the time they felt defeated, not being able to move to the next level. At the time they felt emotionally drained because they were stuck and frustrated with not being seen and heard at work. They were done with not growing in their career and they refused to let it continue to negatively impact their personal lives. In our group coaching program, when you are done I'm telling you, not even when you're done, when we start, you are going to start to build a strong executive presence. You're going to learn how to advocate for yourself without feeling like you're bragging. You're going to quiet that self-doubt that pops up and holds you back. You are going to be that change agent that uses their voice and speaks truth to power. I love to talk to all my clients before they enroll in any of my programs. We got to make sure it's the right fit. My point Let's chat to see if this group coaching program is the right fit for you. Scroll down in the show notes to where it says, be seen and heard at work. Click the link. The rest is super easy. You're going to schedule a time for us to chat. And I mean it when I say, I can't wait to chat with you. And if it's the right fit, I would be honored to support you. Okay, friends, let's get back to the episode. You had a great experience. It sounds like Cowboys for sure. Talk a little bit about when you don't have to name names, but like talk about navigating when it's not that great, right? You had a great leader. So what do you do when you work in that toxic work environment? And I ask you this question and for listeners, uh, Cicely was in, we've worked together. She's been a client. She's in our group coaching program. And she was always really good to step up and give women in the group advice when they were stuck in toxic work situations. I'd love everyone else to hear that advice you would give as well and how you navigated that. Yeah, I think it's it's situational, but I think you really have to ask yourself, where is this conflict coming from? Right, And understand, is this something that you're doing? Maybe you can make some improvements and you have to have a hard conversation with yourself. Or do you need to really facilitate and nurture and work with your leader in, in having a better relationship? And I think for me, I learned that Later in my career, I I was always a very private person, didn't really share a lot about myself at work and with people, my colleagues and people that I worked with. And so I think that, you know, I can be honest and say that that's maybe where my challenge and my barrier was, is that not expressing more about myself to my leader because maybe I just didn't feel comfortable depending on the environment. But I realized once I started to open it up, a lot more maybe to my team or even to my leader that that relationship definitely got better. But also I had to really start to have those direct, clear conversations of this is what I'm looking for out of this position. These are my goals. How can you help me get there? 
Or is there some things that you can tell me that I can improve? And in really making sure that that's clear and direct, and then you start to really kind of put those um, deadlines on. So, you know, you're having those biweekly meetings, you're making sure that those different benchmarks that are being set and agreed upon between you and your leader, that they're hit and they are addressed. And then, okay, this is what we need to do to get to the next benchmark. And it's not only holding your, your leader accountable, but it's holding yourself accountable. And, and I've found that that has helped through a toxic environment. And then sometimes there's just situations that you just don't get along with this person. And there you have to evaluate Is it better for you to stay and grind and and put your head down and continue to work? Or is it time for you to look for something else? And and I've been in in both of those situations. So I've been in those negative situations where I really have to say, has my growth stopped? And and do I still have growth here? Even though I love being here, I love the people here. I have such great relationships with these people, with this wonderful organization. But there is a clear concrete wall of my growth here. Am I willing to leave and walk away? And I had to do that. And I felt really bad about it, but it was the best decision that I could ever make. But also I've been in situations that it's been very negative and I realized like, okay, it's not time for me to leave. There's some things that I need to work on myself, to be honest. There's some things that I need to open up and be better at and improve at. And so now I'm going to take the steps and having those conversations with my leader, being clear and direct and making sure, you know, having those benchmarks, understanding how I can improve. And then you just kind of go from there and be more open. I've also had to realize that all the crap I may be going through at my job, I have no idea what my leader is going through. I have no idea what responsibilities and things they have on their plate. And it's really having that empathy and understanding of, let's create a different environment between myself and my leader. Like, yes, this is my supervisor, but I also have to have, you know, some grace and understanding on what's going on with my leader, but also have to hold myself accountable is that, am I doing everything that I should be doing? I love that perspective. And I I think when you started, the first thing you said was owning your own part. So making sure, okay, is this me? I love that. Both sides. Like, is this me? What am I doing wrong? And then also being clear about what the problem is and outlining it and just saying, okay, like, this is what we're going to work on. Just having a clear understanding what the expectations of you are. And because then it it leaves no question. Okay. This is what you want me to do. Okay. I'm going to crush this. I'm going to get feedback from you. I'm going to do this. Okay. If it's still not working, but I'm meeting expectations, then there's a bigger problem. Yeah. Then something else is wrong. Or if I'm meeting, I'm not meeting expectations. I believe I am. And you think I'm not. Like we yeah. can have that debate as yeah. like that rich discussion yeah. as it's well. Understanding, and it's understanding too, right? That that disconnect. And then also saying like, and, and understanding, and, and I've had to hold my, my supervisors accountable saying, hey, you said this on this day, like I will send notes after having a one-on-one. If there's clear, direct benchmarks, you know, then I'm in the meeting, of, hey, okay, I've reached this benchmark. Or are we ready to move forward? And a lot of times you may not get the answer that you want. You may not get the response that you want. And and now it's your responsibility to understand that, okay, there there probably is not going to be any growth. You know, you make it to the next benchmark. If that's not, you're not going to receive the goal or the reaction that you want. Maybe it's time for you to evaluate your position at that company and with that organization. So I really had to realize that like, man, you know, there was a point where I'm hitting every benchmark. I'm, I'm exceeding abundantly. Um, I'm getting high marks. There's constant, wonderful reviews about me, but they're still stagnant in my growth. And I really had to sit with myself and say, okay, this is a business. Could I do this for another year? Do I want to sit here in the same place? Will I be happy? But I, what I wasn't going to do is walk into the office every day and be mad, upset, complain and have a nasty attitude because that's not that's not good either no one wants to go to work with a bad attitude but also you don't want your interactions to be negative with people either and so it's really on yourself to realize that okay is it time for me to leave or do I need to stay stagnant and still grow but if that's a decision that your leader has made that even though you may hit this benchmark you may not see the response or the promotion or you know you going into a leadership role that you want what do you do at that point? And it's really something you have to ask yourself, is that okay? Are you okay with being stagnant? And, and you maybe hit those benchmarks and it never fully get there? Or 
maybe there's some things you need to evaluate and, and to go to another another person that will another organization that will value you. That's why I always tell people you have to have your own goals. Like, yes. yes, you have to have your department goals and what you have to hit, but what are your own personal goals? And if you're not hitting them because mm-hmm. you're hitting that wall, like you said, that concrete wall, because of your manager, well, you have to evaluate, right? And you have to be clear and honest with yourself too. And, and I think, gosh, definitely with the pandemic and even before that, I think I realized even later in my career, after about eight years, I think I realized I was also chasing a title versus chasing the opportunity that was right for me. Mm. And so I've found that, you know, I may have ran so fast to have this certain title and it wasn't all that I expected to be, but it was a lesson that I needed to learn. And, and, and once the, uh, no, the pandemic hit and I really had to sit with myself a- alone in my place for nearly over a year in California, all of these feelings and aspirations, everything kind of just came up you know, especially within my career, because I, I, I lost my, lost my position. And I realized, you know, what was, what was my passion again? What did I love? And it always came back to special events, sports, but I needed to know that once we come out of this, what is my plan? And so that's really when I, I found your platform and what I was so grateful for, for your platform and blessed that I even found you on LinkedIn is because mm. I was searching for a community, you know, being by myself, sitting at home every single day, not not having work, not being able to talk about sports and, and being that that space anymore. You know, I went into a depression. It was really tough. And I think you just even having those cocktails and, and conversations, those monthly cocktails and conversations, a lot of times that was the only time I even saw people, to be honest. That would be the only time that I would interact with women. And I, I think that really helped me t- to have some sense of community, even though, you know, we're all suffering, having some really hard times and, and you know, maybe I'm, I'm secluded at home alone. I really felt that that wonderful community. And, you know, I, I had a few other groups as well, but, but definitely you kind of sparked that in me. And then I realized I wanted to be a part of your career coaching program just to, I wanted to make sure that when I came out and because I knew that I was going to find a position um, that I wanted to be a better me and I wanted to really start to work on my career development as a leader and and one day to be an executive. I I love that. Thanks for sharing. And I like what you said about, well, I hate that you said you were alone, but I love that you were just like, okay, I got to take action. Like you decided to take action. I'm going to do something to get me out of this funk because COVID was a hard time and you are, you know, one of so many who lost their job. But what I love what you said is, I knew I was going to bounce back. I knew I was going to find a role. Like that was your confidence coming through. And when I talked to you, you're like, I know I'm going to find something. It was hard, but you bounced back and you're, I mean, like literally we're sitting here talking and you, you know, you just started this new job. And before that you were at the Olympics. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was in Tokyo. And then that was an amazing experience, you know, even during the, these times, but I've always wanted to go to Tokyo and have that experience and, and be a part, have some kind of touching the, the Olympic games for sure. But yeah. And I'll say even through the pandemic, that took me a while to realize, like, I'm going to find a position. I want to stay in sports because, you know, when it first happened, I was questioning everything. Because for the first time in my life, I had to sit at home and think, you know, think about things because, you know, what it did do, the pandemic kind of took away my loves. It took away my love for working in sports and special events. It took away my love for, for running and participating in marathons. So, so my normal schedule was to, to train every day. I was typically running, you know, three to four marathons a year. So I was always training. And then on top, I had a crazy work schedule. But when all of that fully stopped, man, it was hard. It was a really hard moment to realize, like, okay, what am I doing? Am I happy where I'm at? What is my life all about? But I realized after some time and really kind of making it through those hard times of like, you know what? No, this is something that I love because I I did think about maybe I should change careers. Maybe I should do something that I love. And it all, you know, all of my evaluations and note taking and and really taking that time to, to understand more about me. I knew that I wanted to be in this industry 
and that I just, I can't, I can't walk away, even though I may had background in biochemistry. And I, I honestly, I could, especially during that time, I could go in and find a lab job and, and, and hopefully help and be a part of, you know, even some of the, the clinical trials of, of vaccines and things like that. I, I thought about that just because of my employment situation, but it just, you know, I think God was speaking to me that he needed me to sit down and be quiet and listen but he also ignited that passion of like, no, you deserve to be in this. Just wait, just, just hold up and wait. And so coming out of that, having an opportunity to be a part of, of the Olympic Games, you know, again, my love for travel, I was just delighted and excited. Think about that. You were let go because of COVID and then you, you listened to God and sat still. And you were quiet <laughs> and Your next role was the Olympics. Anyone out there who's listening, it's just, it's okay if you're still recovering from COVID. It's okay if you're not in the position that you want to be in. There's hope. Like, I mean, you're living proof. How long were you uh, unemployed? Uh, Nearly a year. And especially in the events business, we're still slowly coming back. And I do have a lot of great friends and colleagues that left the industry just because Mm. they realized there's something else that they wanted to do. And, And for me, I couldn't leave. It's just something that, it, you know, it's what wakes me up every day. You know, mm. this business, this industry, it's just truly something that I love. I could do um, every day if I wasn't getting paid for it. But yeah, it was a long time. It was about a year of being unemployed. and But I always knew it, it took me a while, but I definitely said, you know what? No, I'm going to Now start to maybe work on some career development skills. And and that's when kind of took your class. I took a public speaking class. I I got a life coach. And so really I focused on that because I wanted to be the better Sicily that I knew that was, you know, once we come out of this, I was going to come out with a bang for sure. And I mean, I mean, Olympics, Olympics. (laughs) (laughs) you absolutely did. Like what bigger bang than that? Like that is fantastic. Yeah. All right. Are you ready? for rapid fire questions. Yeah, let's go. (laughs) All right. 12 questions. First thing that comes to your mind, favorite sports moment. Ooh, favorite sports moment. God, that's so hard. That's such a hard question. (laughs) I would would probably definitely say, so my brother played at the University of Tennessee with Peyton Manning, and it would be a, a home Tennessee volunteers games any day yeah for sure and especially when they play the university of florida which is why i still do not like that university i won't say the other word (laughs) never like florida gators ever but yeah just the 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 roaring of the, the university the fans the music the tailgating is amazing. (laughs) Balls for sure. That that was kind of my, my, my favorite memory and Super Bowl. I would definitely say my experience with Super Bowls. I've been lucky enough to experience nine Super Bowls, whether working or attending as a family member. And everyone is, is awesome. I mean, my, my life goal, if I could like produce a halftime show, it would be just tears in my eyes. And so, yeah, I'm, excited and crossing my fingers. And I know one day I will produce a Super Bowl halftime show. Yes. <laughs> yes. And when you do, I'm going to cut this clip and play it <laughs> for everybody. Yes. Like, please. Remember when you said you were going to do it. I see it happening. I can't wait until the day that you do that as well. What is something people always get wrong about you? You know, I'd probably say they think I have it all together. I, I will definitely admit that I do a really good job at being a great presentation of myself. And again, right, it's this opportunity to be vulnerable with others that I definitely had to learn later in life. And I think sometimes, you know, I do love a dress. I love a beautiful suit, pink suit and some wonderful earrings and doll up and jazz up for the games, game days for sure. I love to, you know, put my outfits together. And I, I have heard that, that people are like, oh my God, you have such an amazing life and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, yeah, if you only knew what happened last night. <laughs> just like the insecurities or maybe, you know, maybe something happened the night before that I just I didn't feel so secure about myself or kind of the, the loneliness sometimes that, that I have. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, maybe sometimes people think I have it all together, but a lot of times I don't. Like I, I can relate to that. People are like, oh my God, you are just living, you know, you like, and they're looking at Instagram, you know? Yeah. Right. Oh my God. You have so much fun. You do so much stuff. You are so great. I'm like, I mean, it is, I'm having fun, 
but life in general is just hard. Yeah, <laughs> it's just well, hard, I, and I'm I, human. And especially in this industry of, you don't have the typical nine to five. I mean, it's it's definitely a journey, and you have to have a work ethic like no other. A hundred percent. What's one food you wouldn't want to give up? Oh, that is pizza. Uh, without a doubt, because I have to give this up like when I'm, I'm training for my marathon races, which I'm doing right now. And I'm craving so bad a New York style saucy like people or they call them pies here. Yep. And oh, I know. <laughs> really thinking about it. But yeah, pizza. I, I could eat pizza every single day if it had no fat, zero calories. Same. That I used to eat pizza every single day. And like, I grew up in New Jersey. So I'm, I'm very familiar with that pizza you're talking about and like would order, you know what I mean? Like, Hey, can I have a, a large pie? Like people, my moods, I'd order it and people would be like, what? And I'm like, can I have a large pizza? Like, <laughs> yeah. like well, how many plates do you need? Uh, just one. Cause I'm going to eat this. <laughs> well, please, thanks. Um, it's like crack here. The pizza here is crack. It's 100% crack. And the problem is is that when I was in my teens and early 20s, I could eat pizza like and be fine. (laughs) Yes. Now I eat pizza and it's like, oh, nothing fits anymore. It's just a whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm kind of grateful that I don't live in New Jersey, New York for that very reason. I have no idea. What part of New Jersey? I am from Manalapan, New Jersey. Oh, where's that? (laughs) I wish you all could see her facial expressions. That's why I'm laughing so hard. It is by, it's in Monmouth County, smack dab in the middle, central Jersey by like Freehold. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's where my, um, my father grew up born and raised and then my mother, uh, moves there. Uh, and that's where they met in Jersey city. And it looks so different than it is. Uh, it is now (laughs) you, I, we've talked about this. I'm like, uh, yeah, that's not what it looked like when I used to go there and spend my summers. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. We are not doing well with this, this rapid fire. <laughs> are you a morning person or a night person? I hate mornings, but I'm a morning person. I relate so hard to that. <laughs> so I like totally understand that. Favorite holiday? Christmas. I, yes, I have Christmas music all year. Oh, you're one of those people. Okay. Yeah. I'm learning a lot more about you through these. What job would you absolutely be horrible at doing? Hmm. You know what? I uh, somewhat have a fear of heights. So like the folks that work roller coasters at amusement parks, I would be horrible at that. Yeah, that, would, yeah, that wouldn't be a good place for you. Yeah, I don't think I could operate that properly or I would like mess something up and leave somebody like 800 feet in the air. And I just, yeah, I wouldn't be good at that at all. Okay, if I ever see you at like Disney yeah. working, <laughs> I, I will not get on that ride. What product would you seriously stockpile if you found out they weren't going to sell it anymore? Eyeliner. Oh yeah. You were not looking at me. I'm like looking at your eyes. I'm like, oh yeah. See, but yeah. you do such a good job with your makeup. I've never noticed that. What is your favorite app? I don't know about my favorite. I just open it a lot and it's just like my Gmail app. I'm not very tech savvy. Let me admit that. With my lovely Samsung. No, I'm not an iPhone or Apple supporter. (laughs) You know what? Let me say Amazon. That's probably the only app that I'm on a lot. We all are. If you had to pick Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn. I don't really use any of those that much. (laughs) Okay. If I had to pick Instagram and I'm barely on that. Yeah. You have like times when like you'll pop up and you're on for a while and then you're gone for like three months I, like, I know what's Cic- Cicely up to now and you're usually running somewhere yeah who's your biggest inspiration in life it's hard to say one but I, I would probably just say like the close the close friends that I have uh, my I would definitely say my aunt Carolyn she's one of my, my biggest inspirations and, and someone who always is positive and, and very supportive of everything that I do Hey, Auntie. Hopefully she's listening. As a, ch- <laughs> As a child, what did you wish to become when you grew up? I wanted to be a nurse teacher. I used to always say that when I was little. So I wanted to like teach nurses their profession. I don't know why, but it was in, it was always in the because I love science. I always love science and, and biology and, and, and chemistry and things like that. And so I really thought I was going to be a nurse teacher uh, or a, uh, a doctor. So yeah. yeah. And then that changed when I saw that fat 
grad school, I mean, that med school bill. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is enough to make you be like, eh, I don't think so. All right, finish this sentence. The future of women working in sports is? Filled with beautiful women of color, Black women, Latina women, mm. Asian women, all, all women, even different sexual orientations, LBGTQ community. I think diversity and in having different perspectives is what the future of our industry definitely needs, that they all have value. And it's not just one, it's many of those mm. different groups and, and representation truly matters. Yeah, without a doubt. And I wanna make sure that if I can make an impact and to teach others that are need that support and need that help, you know, now my life goal is to make sure that I help the next generation for sure. That was a good one. I like that. I don't yeah. think anyone has ever talked about it that way before. I love it. Oh, All right, Cicely, this has been amazing. If someone wants to get in touch with you, how can they go about doing that? Yeah, so feel free. I am definitely active on LinkedIn. So feel free to reach out to me, Cicely Nash. Find me on LinkedIn and, and shoot me a message. And I'd love to hear from anyone who's interested in chatting with me. All right. Thank you so much for spending so much time with us. We appreciate it. Hey, thank you. This was fun. Thanks so much. So what did you think of this episode? Do you know another woman who works or is aspiring to work in sports? Would you do me a favor and share this with them? It would mean so much if together we could support and inspire other women on their journey. And let's stay connected. I love meeting and talking to new people. Follow me on Instagram at Jahan Blake and join the free Game of Her Own community by visiting jahanblake.com. I can't wait to meet you.